Uh, anyway, so I'm here in uh, Nome Pen, Cambodia. I want to get to offshore banking. A lot of news going on with that. Uh, a lot of articles that I see uh, coming into my email inbox. People send me things from uh, uh, newspapers or uh, web articles. And I'm not going to talk about Cambodian offshore banking. I'm not going to do that. Although I did see an ad today in the Nome Pen Post uh, for a bank offering uh, basically 10% interest on your uh, on your money when you deposit in the Cambodian riel. Uh, they use dollars here, but uh, if you put it in the riel, they'll give you a hefty interest. So at least at least here they know uh, that uh, their banking sector is not the best. Uh, unlike the United States, which was ranked 40th safest. Uh, in a 2008 banking survey, uh, but uh, when you don't have sociopaths like Ben Bernanke uh, controlling the interest rates, you can actually make some real interest. Back in the good old days, right? Uh, anyway, offshore banking, uh, an article in the Globe and Mail, Canadian newspaper, I got sent this article from uh, Toronto, written by Romina Morino. Romina writes, an offshore bank account may seem like an intimidating prospect and one that could lead to trouble if it isn't done right. But experts say that as long as you follow the appropriate reporting rules set out by the Canada Revenue Agency, offshore bank accounts can be a practical and in some cases necessary way to deal with your finances. When we hear about offshore, we think tax evasion, palm trees, and tax havens, said Jamie Golembeck, Managing Director of Tax and Estate Planning at CIBC Private Wealth Management. But there's certainly no problem with having an offshore bank account to do offshore banking, for example, if you vacation or if you own property outside Canada. Uh, or if you're just worried that your tyrannical government is going to come in and decide they uh, want to scrape up some of your dough and put it into their coffers. I added that part. The woman from CIBC did not say that. Uh, how could she? All these banks are in bed with the government. <laughs> they do their bidding every day. If you have a place in Florida or a place in Arizona, it makes a lot of sense. Setting up an account in the U.S. or abroad is no different than opening a bank account in Canada, and if it's being simply used as a checking account... There aren't any additional fees. Uh, the one fee that you might have to worry about is that uh, uh, if you run, a, uh, run afoul of one of the U.S. government's FACACTA rulings, uh, one of the millions of directives they put out that uh, they never promote and few people know about, uh, then they might just confiscate half of your money like they do for other U.S. account holders. So that, that could be a fee. Uh, but other than that, don't, don't worry. No fees when you bank in the U.S. Who's banking offshore in the U.S.? Is that really offshore banking? Uh, I'd say it's like playing Russian roulette. Uh, so that's the Globe and Mail talking about why you should have an offshore bank account in the United States. Interesting stuff. Also, I've seen several articles, and we wrote this, I, I wrote about this at nomadcapitalist.com uh, on Tuesday about the Bank of Ireland shutting down its operations in the Isle of Man. Uh, they're pulling the plug, I believe, um, early next year. They're closing, uh, they're closing down the whole thing. They're closing immediately uh, to new depositors. They'll be figuring out a way to get people's money back to them. So basically, the Bank of Ireland, uh, which uh, is in a troubled economy in Ireland, uh, they've had difficulties to say the least, uh, we had Reggie Middleton on the show not that long ago talking about all the troubles they've had over there. It's a real shame uh, because Ireland is a uh, beautiful country, great people. But uh, they're uh, screwed up over there at the Bank of Ireland. They've got uh, some issues, and uh, they're focusing on the core operation in Ireland. That means that the offshore unit in the Isle of Man will be closed down, and it is not the first time that... Uh, an offshore bank in the Isle of Man has been shuttered. All these banks in Europe and the UK and uh, uh, elsewhere over there, they're running into problems. And uh, in order to uh, you know, plug the leaks, they are shutting down the far-flung operations, uh, the offshore operations. And, and believe you me, they need offshore bank, Isle of Man off the coast of uh, 
of UK, they need offshore banking in the UK just as much as uh, you do in the US. Uh, that government is out of control as well. And uh, there was even talk not that long ago, uh, speculation I think, but nevertheless that the UK would be uh, uh, possibly one of the next governments or that they were one of the governments considering citizenship-based taxation. Uh, so the U.S. being the only country, basically, that does that. Um, the U.K. was rumored to have been considering that. Uh, not, not basically giving you no escape hatch. If you were, if you were born in the U.K., you would have, have no uh, way to escape U.K. income taxes, other than uh, renouncing your citizenship. Uh, so the Bank of Ireland is closing down. Fewer options in the Isle of Man. Well, we wrote about that, like I said. Uh, look, the government loves this. Uh, they love banks shutting down the offshore operations because uh, it gives people fewer options. Fewer options means uh, they can put the screws to fewer banks. Uh, we know that in the United States, uh, banks like J.P. Morgan make billions and billions of dollars uh, being in bed with the government. Uh, for example, uh, J.P. Morgan issues all the food stamp cards. Uh, in the United States, uh, makes about five and a half billion dollars doing that. You think they want? You think if the U.S. government came to J.P. Morgan and said, "Hey, uh, close off all the escape hatches for Americans," you don't think J.P. Morgan would roll over and do their bidding? I, I suspect they would. So it's always sad seeing this happen. Uh, it's chilling because. Um, We've seen just how many banks and just how many businesses, big businesses, are willing to get in bed with uh, the government, wherever they are. If they want to curry favor with the government, uh, and they'll do what it takes. And uh, if there are fewer places for you to go, I believe that the uh, your government uh, could get uh, bigger cojones to uh, start shutting down offshore options. In the U.S., they're already doing that with laws like FATCA, and uh, other de facto capital controls that uh, uh, they don't have to say they're keeping your money in the United States or they're, they're pushing to keep your money in the U.S., but uh, they're basically doing it by making uh, dealing with U.S. citizens so difficult that, that financial institutions just say uh, it's not worth it. Uh, so that's what's going on in offshore uh, banking. There's an article also down in the Bahamas complaining about... Um, uh, how the international financial services industry is 72 times, get this, 72 times larger than the country's GDP. Uh, the IMF is down there uh, grousing about that uh, because the IMF wants to make sure you keep your money in your home country. Wherever you're born, that's your slave uh, territory. That's, that's the plantation you were born to, and you better keep your money there. Uh, so the IMF is off to uh, making news down in the Caribbean, uh, putting out white papers and all sorts of other stuff, uh, complaining about the Caribbean financial services industry, saying the Bahamas is the fourth largest offshore financial center after the Caymans, uh, Hong, Pong, uh, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, Singapore's financial sector is one and a half times larger than the Bahamas. Um, but... Uh, by the way, here's what's amazing. All these organizations, the U.S. government has brainwashed its people to uh, believe that it is the most noble government in the history of man, that it has done more for humankind than any other entity ever. Uh, which well, you don't have to look any further than right here in Cambodia, just uh, is exhibit A of many, to uh, to see just how much harm U.S. government has done to uh, many people, millions of people. But the U.S. government loves to go around and uh, talk about all the people it is, uh, whose lives it has helped. Yet uh, the U.S. government, along with the IMF and the World Bank and the, um, the bozos over at the OECD, that's basically a group of rich countries that uh, hate low taxes, the OECD, all these organizations that love to tell you how they're uh, for the poor and the downtrodden, they want to help people, and they want to use your tax dollars to do it, uh, they love complaining about Bahamas. They love complaining about the Cayman Islands. Barack Obama called the Cayman Islands a tax scam. What would the Cayman Islands, what would Bahamas be if it weren't for having financial sectors that were many times larger than their economy? I'm not telling you to go to the Bahamas and bank. Uh, but 
it isn't it interesting that um, all these governments that want to lift people out of poverty uh, go down to these uh, to places like these Caribbean islands uh, where people are poor, where people don't have that much money, uh, where uh, on some of these islands like St. Kitts and Nevis they are uh, they sell citizenships to raise money for their sugar fund because all the sugar workers they can't uh, there's no sugar anymore and uh, they need to bring in some dough some other way so they're out uh, they'll sell you a passport to help support these workers the US government does not care about those people none of these organiz- uh, organizations care about those people they just care about power they care about keeping your money where they can control it where they can seize it where they can tax it where they can uh, do whatever they want and they don't, by the way, they don't know what they're going to do with it yet, necessarily. They just know that uh, whenever the mood strikes, uh, whenever uh, they wake up and feel a good confiscation coming on, they want to know that, that the money is there waiting for them. They don't want to have to track it down. It's like the police wanting to, uh, wanting to shut down Bitcoin. Police go around complaining how drug dealers use Bitcoin, and they need to shut down Bitcoin so that they, uh, you know, it's easier for them to track down the drug dealers. So drug dealers have to go back to uh, doing transactions in cash and back alleyways where uh, cops can find them. So basically uh, what you have is the police uh, wanting to in- infringe on your economic freedom because they're too lazy to do their own jobs. It's the same thing here. Governments don't like, uh, like offshore banking because it makes it harder for them to track down your dough. And I'm not saying to do anything illegal. Uh, just like the Globe and Mail reported... I believe in reporting and following the law. I don't believe in uh, unreported offshore accounts. If you're a U.S. citizen, that's a no-no, and you should not do it. Uh, because uh, there's no benefit, really. They'll find you, they'll track you down, they'll take all of your money, no one can stop them. So you, you should follow the rules. And you can still protect yourself while following the rules, but, but you have to know what the adversary is and what they're doing. They want your money where they can take it. Uh, so don't listen to these uh, reports that talk about, oh, uh, the size of the uh, the economy. Listen, they did this after Cyprus. After they stole money from people's bank accounts, and people, business owners, lost hundreds of thousands of euros, uh, then the, uh, the people over there, all the EU bureaucrats, went around and said, oh, well, look at Luxembourg. It has a big banking sector for its size, too. Well, that's probably, it's, it, it's probably a risk. And they just, they use these crazy metrics that are totally skewed in their favor to try and convince people that offshore banking, uh, which but for Luxembourg, people from Germany go to Luxembourg. It's not exactly that offshore. It's it's like a train right away. I I, I took a train to Luxembourg and back from uh, from Brussels in the same day. About two years ago. Not exactly some uh, some place with palm fronds waving you know, 5,000 miles away. Uh, but this is what they'll tell you to do. Now, um, it is interesting that uh, this article in the Bahamas mentioned banking in Singapore. Uh, again, not, uh, not telling you what to do, but uh, I'm a fan. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine today who lives in Singapore and was telling me how he uh, pays $6,000 a month in rent for a uh, three-bedroom apartment. Uh, very nice three-bedroom apartment, but still. Uh, so do I want to live in Singapore? Not necessarily. But uh, economic freedom, they're, uh, they're right up there. And uh, so if you are looking to get started in building an escape hatch, we, are, uh, we have a special offer. Uh, through this month only, through August only, you've got a couple days left. Uh, you can go to uh, nomadcapitalist.com. You can find, or you can just Google Guide to Banking in Singapore. This is uh, our guide to uh, opening an offshore bank account in Singapore. Again, you should always do your due diligence. You should uh, figure out the right bank for you, the right jurisdiction for you. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, so don't think that it is. But uh, if you like the idea of Singapore, if you like banking in Asia, then we have a guide that walks you through uh, some of the analysis on Singapore, it walks you through which banks will take you, what the requirements are, uh, do you want a private banking uh, arrangement, 
Do you want to just throw a few bucks in somewhere and uh, see what happens? Um, if you decide that that's for you, we have a special deal on our guide to banking in Singapore. It's a $10 off coupon. Just use coupon code OFFSHORE. And uh, you'll get $10 off the banking guide uh, if you want to learn more about banking in Singapore. Um, Singapore, let me tell you, they are uh, making a concerted effort to uh, be the top offshore jurisdiction, not just for banking, but uh, we've written extensively about offshore gold holdings. And I see, um, uh, I, look, I, I never assume, I, look, I, I view this whole offshore community as just that, as a community. Uh, we have guys who run websites on this show. We have Pete Cisco, uh, Bobby Casey. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk frequently with other people who run websites that are similar to what we do. Uh, I, I don't view people as competitors. I, uh, I'm friends with most of the guys who talk about the stuff that we talk about here at Nomad Capitalist. I, I am. And there are some great guys uh, with great advice. Uh, Jeff Berwick, a nice guy. Um, but I've seen, we, uh, we put out a, a bunch of articles on offshore gold in Singapore a couple months ago, and now I see uh, other people are, are talking about it, which is fine, uh, because I think the more information out there, the better informed that you, the public, will be. This is, this is serious stuff, and you need to be prepared. But, uh, we were talking about offshore gold a couple months ago, and, um... Singapore is making a concerted effort. I mean, really, really working hard to uh, get up to ten percent of the world's uh, off of the world's gold holdings. In just a couple of years, they're at uh, about two percent right now, or when they started, and uh, they are really pushing hard. They understand where their bread is buttered. They understand they need to get up and take some action in order to get some money into their country. That's what built their country fifty three years ago. Uh, it was part of Malaysia or Malaya at that time, uh, now Malaysia, and uh, it took them two years to realize they couldn't get along with the uh, with the Malays, and um, and they broke off. And at that time, it was uh, it was nothing like it is now. Uh, in about two generations, they built it into an economic powerhouse, and um, and they realized that with and they, they did that by realizing that. Uh, with about 250 square miles, basically this postage stamp size of land at the uh, the foot of the Malay Peninsula, they realized they had to do something different. They couldn't just be like the U.S. or the U.K. Uh, or any of the uh, these other bankrupt governments, now bankrupt governments, who uh, just figure they can sit on their heels and they can screw with people and do whatever they want and get away with it and, and still be prosperous. Although we can see how those chickens are coming home to roost, uh, prosperous for how long. But Singapore, they understand how it works. They understand freedom. They understand they have to uh, give people the freedom to do what they want with their money. And so I, that's uh, the IMF can can complain about uh, the oversized banking sectors in some of these offshore jurisdictions all they want. The reality is, people look. Capital goes where it's treated best. That is the whole point behind our site. That's the whole idea behind Nomad Capitalist. That you and your money should go where you are treated best. That is the natural flow of things. That is how nature works. Go where you are treated best. If your money is being scorned in the United States or wherever else you are, go where you're treated best. Find that place and go there. Don't just don't take it. You don't have to take it. There are 200 countries in the world, and they all would be happy to have your money. It's just a matter of what's best for you. We've there's we've come up with this concept in the West where what's best for you has been made a dirty word. Heaven forbid you would do something that's good for you. You earned the money, but uh, they'll tell you what to do with it. So, uh, if you want to learn about banking in Singapore, it's like I said, it's 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 not for every person. But if you've done your homework and you like the idea of uh, of uh, opening a bank account in Singapore, it's a uh, it's a it's a well-renowned place for uh, for economic freedom. And you can go to nomadcapitalist.com. We've got a big banner on the top. You can click on the Singapore guide. Enter coupon code offshore. But you've got to do it this month, August of 2013 only. Obviously, after that, you can uh, still go and get it. It's still a great, it's a great deal. 
Uh, you get a ton of information. And if you're not happy, you, you know, email us and we'll, you know, we'll give you your money back. We don't want you to pay for something that uh, isn't useful to you. But um, if you uh, take advantage of that this month only, you get a special $10 discount. Uh, all right. <laughs> 